9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. If you were going to San Francisco in the 60s, you would uh, wear flowers in your hair. Now, of course, that was a sign that you were a part of the uh, flower children, a part of the uh, peace, love, dove generation. Uh, it's interesting that during this time, uh, there was a, a symbol that was popularized that was called the peace symbol. Uh, it was an upside-down cross, though, that was broken. And basically, what that peace sign uh, represented was the rejection of Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. It had nothing to do with really anybody that wanted peace or was seeking after peace, but it was actually a blasphemous symbol that came out of the Dark Ages that really represented, represented the rejection of Jesus Christ, who is indeed the Prince of Peace. But this became uh, popularized as a, uh, as a peace symbol. Um, many people were um, tricked into believing, though, that this was a symbol of peace. Satan just seems to uh, uh, be so deceptive in his uh, deceiving people today, and there are even those today that we see on the back of, you know, particularly on the back of the, uh, uh, the Volkswagen vans, you know, uh, the, 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 the cars that came right out of the 60s, you know, the, the peace mobiles, we would call them, as we'd see people, you know, traveling around in them and all, but you can see what was called the, the peace sign, but it is not a sign of peace, it's a sign of rejection, rejecting the Prince of Peace, and I bring that out because uh, we still see that sign today, and we should be made aware of it. But the cry of the 60s generation was peace, peace. We want peace, and so the protests, because of, uh, of the Vietnam War that was taking place at this time, people were crying out uh, for an end to the war. The Vietnam War was a horrible war. What war isn't a horrible war, but it was an extremely horrible war, but this war was brought right into our living rooms. And each day, uh, at the end of the day, the, um, uh, the, the totals for that day uh, were brought before us. The casualties, the number that were killed, and the number that were, uh, were wounded. And so this was really the first television war that was brought. It was brought right uh, into our homes. And it was then that uh, the nation also desperately cried out for peace to be made and for an, for an end to the war. And this continued on into the 70s as the, as the war lingered on, uh, and the protesters for peace kept trying to make their point, war isn't working. Uh, and of course, uh, if uh, they could get an end to war, well then that must mean that there would be peace if there was uh, an end to war. Uh, logically speaking, that's what we would think. Uh, you might remember the theme song uh, of this era uh, was, All We Are Saying Is Give Peace a Chance. Uh, I, I find it tragic, I find it uh, sad, that about ten years after this uh, song was the you know, the, maybe the, uh, the anthem of the day. And after peace was agreed upon, uh, the writer of that song, John Lennon, was gunned down on the streets of New York City in a violent uh, act of crime, if you will. So much for his attempts to rally people together for peace. And so uh, what's changed today? Uh, what's changed in our world that we live in? Not much, huh? Not much has changed. The world maybe even has gotten more violent, if you will. Uh, wars seem to be as common as the sunrise. Each day there's a, there's a new outbreak somewhere. Uh, each day there's, there's crime that is reported. Uh, tragic events that are just taking place all over the world, but also right in our communities, right in our very neighborhood. Um, just because there has been a peace accord signed or an agreement reached, uh, we still read of the killings and the bombings and the uprising. The world is not a peaceful place to live in. Our neighborhoods are not safe places to live in. 
We have drive-by shootings, we have the robberies, we have the break-ins, and for many, even in our homes, it's not peaceful. But there's, there's anxiety and there's struggles and there's wars that are going on, even behind closed doors in our homes. Violence taking place. Violence that has become even more and more of a common occurrence, unfortunately, because there is no peace. How often do we turn on the evening news and we hear of one of these tragic events that have taken place and the person being interviewed, they say about their neighborhoods, I didn't think this could ever happen in my neighborhood. That's why I moved here. And yet the wars continue. The strife continues. The violence continues. The crime continues. There's really not a lot of peace taking place. As Jesus spoke to his disciples here in the Sermon on the Mount, as he was describing a certain person, the unique characteristics, if you will, of that person that would distinguish his kingdom, who would be the citizens of his kingdom, we call these the Beatitudes that we've gone through for the last several uh, weeks, last couple of months. But there must have been confusion going on. Maybe reach this rung of the ladder. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of the living God. What was Jesus talking about? On one hand, some may have thought that, well, 30 years. And so for anybody that was you know, really looking around, uh, living in the Roman Empire at that particular time, certainly they thought that, well, there's peace. The doors to the Temple Janus are closed. And if they're closed, well, that must mean peace. But what really appeared to be peace wasn't really what was going on in a lot of the people's hearts. Some may have thought Jesus was talking about, look, let's just keep the status quo. Things are going along pretty good right now, you know. We're not, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's just kind of hang, hang loose for a while. Let's not rock the boat. But in the hearts of many, particularly the Jews who were looking for the Messiah, they were not looking for a man to come to establish peace, but they were looking for a man to come as a military leader who would lead them in victory over the oppression of Rome. Rome had dealt a heavy hand. And though, as I said before, it seemed like there may have been peace on the outside, what was going on in the inside of many people's hearts and lives was that we got to break out from under this yoke. We have to overcome the Roman Empire. And they were looking for the Messiah to come in actuality to lead them in military battle that there would be victory over Rome and that Israel would actually become the world leader, because they were so oppressed. Their backs were being broke by Rome. So these didn't want peace. They wanted war. And now they're listening to Jesus as he says, blessed are the peacemakers. I can imagine them just trying their best to figure out and make some sense out of what he is saying. They've already been challenged. Challenged to, to the very core of their life. And their very being. As they started at the bottom rung of the, the ladder of the Beatitudes. And remember Jesus is speaking to his disciples here. Those who have chosen to follow him. He's not really speaking to the multitudes, although the multitudes certainly that had gathered there on the Mount of Beatitudes could have overheard what he was saying. Was he, but he was specifically speaking to those who were his disciples. And he's already dealt with them in some very severe ways, particularly in dealing with self. He dealt with that emptying process of self that they may be filled with the righteousness of Christ. First of all, dealing with self-sufficiency when he said to them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And then he dealt with self-satisfaction in their life when he said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They couldn't be satisfied with themselves anymore because they had now seen themselves as they are in the light of who God is. And so he dealt with them also in self-importance. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then after that emptying, the filling comes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Having been filled with the righteousness of God and Christ, then the outflow of the believer's life. Having tasted the mercy of God, having seen God in His work in their lives, the result then would be evidenced in showing mercy towards others. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then last week we talked about the pure in heart. They're the ones that will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. No longer is their life divided, their heart divided. No longer is it my will and God's will trying to be brought together to to make it all work. But now it's a, a unified heart that is seeking after God, a purified heart that is seeking after Him. And what a promise. They shall see God. What a promise for those who have come up the ladder of the Beatitudes. And then it's truly only then that that this next Beatitude really makes any sense because it's only after one's spiritual eyes have truly been opened, seen God, that this statement, which really is one that um, motivates one to further action of being a peacemaker, can really be seen in one's life. Blessed are the peacemakers... For they shall be called sons of God. Notice he doesn't say peacekeepers, but he says peacemakers. What does he mean? What is Jesus saying here to his disciples? Many have come to the conclusion that it, that it really is a call to passiveness on the part of the believer's life. And many that probably heard him at this time thought that, yeah, let's not rock the boat. Things are okay. If others want to fight, hey, Let them go ahead and fight. Let them go ahead and stir up some trouble. But we conscientiously object to this and we're not going to fight. We're not going to get involved. We're not going to make waves. And so the cry of these from their passive retreat, if you will, was all we are saying is give peace a chance. This isn't what Jesus was talking about. Think about just a little bit later on when we get down to chapter 10 in verse 34 when Jesus said, Don't think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. That sounds a little aggressive to me. That doesn't sound like passively just sitting by and and letting things take place, uh, come as they will, come as they may. Because you see, a peacemaker is really more than one who is in a passive state of existence. It's more than the absence of fighting and more than the absence of war that Jesus is talking about here, but many believe today that this is the Christian's role in the world. That we are to be just pacifists and we are to sit back and just, you know, either join the marches or uh, whatever, you know, and, and cry out, all we are saying is give peace a chance. But we're really not to get involved in any issue. Well, we'll talk about the issue that we are to get involved in in just a minute because this is wrong and it's not what Jesus is talking about. With all of the protests that are going on, with all of the the peace ends and all, we still have a world today, a world today that is still facing wars constantly, that is still facing crime. We still see people fighting in the schoolyards and in the bars and behind closed doors in their homes. We still see all of these things taking place. Why? Because no matter how idealistically one may be, how sincere in their hearts they may be about crying out for peace, 
realistically, if the heart of the issue is not addressed, then nothing's still the same. And there won't be any changes. Because you can sit around the peace, paper, peace table all if you want. You can sign as many peace agreements as you want. You can pass the peace pipe. You can send out the troops to keep the peace. You can send a mediator. You can send a counselor. You can send the police. But until the real issue is addressed, the heart of man, then nothing has really been confronted. And the desired hope will never be realized. Remember what James wrote in his letter, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, 1 through 3. Where do wars come from? Why are all the fightings taking place? Where do they come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your members. See, it's very self-centered. It's very self-motivated. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. But you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so their hearts that are motivated selfishly with ambition and greed and lust for power and control. And nothing will stand in the way of those whose desire it is to satisfy this evil and wicked in their heart. It stirs from within and it goes out from there. Where do wars come from? They come from the selfish, greed, self-serving lusts in our own members. And so twice we read in Isaiah, in chapter 48, verse 22, in, 57, in chapter 57, verse 21, there is no peace, saith the Lord, for the wicked. Those who have that intention, that self-motivation, that self-serving, self-satisfaction, self-importance, Ambition for greed and lust for power. There is no peace in their heart. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Now, a peacemaker is also not one who simply will stand in between or get in between two factions, if you will, who are fighting amongst each other to keep the peace. You know, we, uh, in the world situation today, we, we are always hearing of the, the UN peacekeeping forces. And to me, it's really, um, well, it's a joke if you ask me. And it's a joke, why? Because the problem that they're trying to solve, number one, isn't political. The problem they're trying to solve isn't social. The problem they're trying to solve isn't economical. The problem is sin. The root problem is sin. In the heart of man. And that's, what at the, and that's at the heart of the very issue that needs to be changed. No matter what the world's situation may be. No matter which nation is fighting against nation. No matter which country against country. No matter which person against person. It's in the heart. It's the heart issue. That's the root of the problem. And if the root of the problem isn't solved. Then the fruit's just going to continue to grow and manifest. And it's going to be rotten. Rotten to the core. Nothing but a new heart and a new man who is born again will ever solve the problem. So Jesus isn't really talking about the stopping of two people or nations from fighting or getting in between them for a while. But he's talking about getting to the root issue, a cause that goes so much deeper, so much deeper than what we see on the surface. Jesus isn't talking about the superficial is issues here. He's talking about getting right down to the root cause, the stuff that's really important. And so he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Happy to be envied are the peacemakers. Now notice who they are. For they shall be called sons of God. Those who have come into a living relationship with him 
who have been filled with His righteousness, who have embraced the truth of God's Word. Those who are living in fellowship and communion with Him, whom the Bible calls the God of peace. Romans chapter 15, verse 33 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, and Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. The God of the Bible is called the God of peace. And we are called the sons of God. And so we are those who have been brought into His family, into fellowship with Him. And so we are the ones then that have been given the privilege, the privilege to proclaim the peace of that only comes from the one who is the source of peace, the God of peace, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as he's describing here to his disciples who they are and what really is just one of the missions of their life, to be peacemakers. And if we're going to be peacemakers, then we must be willing and we must be ready to make a stand for truth and stand for righteousness. You've heard the expression, peace at any price. Well, what if that price is war? Because I believe in peace at any price, even if the price is war. But most people who embrace this idea of peace at any price, they're really thinking of some kind of compromise. They're not thinking of the option that it may be indeed war. That there's going to be fightings. But I tell you what, if there's no peace within, again, no matter how many peace accords have been signed, wars and fightings will soon develop again. To be peacemakers on God's terms requires standing upon the terms of His truth. Thy word is truth. Standing upon the terms of His word, His truth. Taking a stand for righteousness. And we live today, my friends, in a world that is aggressively opposed to truth and righteousness, the truth and the righteousness of the Word of God. We live next door to, we work with those who are going to resist the truth of God's Word. We live in the same houses with many who also resist God's Word. And when believers bring the truth of God's word to bear upon the world that hates and is opposed to his truth, when believers set God's standard of righteousness before a world that's filled with wickedness, that's filled with selfishness, that's filled with greed, that's filled with lust, let's just bring it right down to what it is, it's filled with sin, then there's going to be strife and there's going to be conflict. We're in this world, but we are not of the world. Peace is not going to reign as long as there is wickedness reigning. There can be no peace where, where sin is reigning. And if we are going to be peacemakers, then we will find ourselves in conflict with the world who is aggressively opposed to and against the word of truth. And this is something that we need to prepare ourselves for. We need to prepare ourselves for this. You remember Jesus going into the temple when the money changers there were taking advantage of the people who were sincerely coming in to, to worship God. And you remember that they took advantage of the people by, by them coming in innocently. Those who had, 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 had maybe worked hard all week and, and all they wanted to do was bring in their sacrifice before the Lord and to offer that before the Lord. But of course their, their little lamb was not, was not clean, was not pure, you know, because they had the whole group of, of animals in the back that were their special temple sacrifices, you know, that could be offered. But this little lamb that they were bringing to offer that wasn't good enough right then would be put back in that flock and they may buy the same thing again. And Jesus saw the hypocrisy in the religious leaders who were taking advantage of those who were coming sincerely to worship God. And you remember he came in and he said, oh boys, you shouldn't be doing that. You're really taking advantage of God's people. He didn't do that, did he? He didn't stand back and cry out, give peace a chance, let these poor people in, you know. And, no, he went in there with his, with his little whip 
He went in there and he turned over the money changers' tables and he went in and threw them out. There was conflict. There was strife. There was a war that was being waged. A war that really dealt with the issues of life and death, eternal life and death. Souls were in the balance. And we need to be willing, and I hope that you are willing, willing to offer the peace of God to those whom you work with, to those who live next door to you, to those you live with. Men and women and family members that we care about. Lost loved ones that we care about who are dying in their sins. We need to be ready for a confrontation. We need to be ready for war. Peacemaker that Jesus is talking about here is the one who will offer to man the terms of God's peace. Jesus Christ. Those who are in rebellion to Him. It's those who are willing to stand for truth and righteousness and to confront the root issue of the problem, which is the heart of man. This is what Jesus meant when He said, Don't think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come, but a sword. Because there will be those who will take a stand. And, we're in, and, and we are in direct confrontation and opposition to those today because of the spiritual battle. Jesus didn't come to put a band-aid on the hearts of men and women. He came to tear out that old heart and to give man a new heart. I believe that much of evangelical Christianity, though, has gone amiss here because I believe that much of evangelical Christianity has offered a social gospel, which is no gospel at all. But it's being offered to sinners without ever confronting the issue of sin. And we have many who are going to church today. We have many who are sitting in pews or on hard chairs, if you will. Many who are thinking nice thoughts, saying nice things, acting in a nice way, going through church rituals and all, but never going to the cross. And sin has been excused. A little band-aid has been put on. But God still condemns it. And so there's no real peace. There's no real peace with God. You know, Jeremiah spoke to the nation Israel. And he spoke to the prophets and he spoke to the priests who were offering the people a watered-down gospel. And that message is still clear and still true and still is valid today. But Jeremiah said, look around you. God is speaking through this prophet. Look around you. Look at the prophets. Look at the priests, how they deal treacherously. They deal falsely with my people, for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. In other words, they put a little band-aid on the people. Saying, peace, peace, but there was no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed their abominations? No. They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall in the time of their punishment. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. And so when we proclaim the gospel of peace, when we proclaim the message here, it may be offensive to the human heart. But even as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but pleasing God who tries our hearts. Because that's the bottom line. There are many sitting in churches today who have received a social gospel. 
Many today sitting in church pews, having received that gospel, thinking and believing that they're going to heaven. But if the heart hasn't changed, if there hasn't been a change in their heart through faith in Jesus Christ, if they haven't been washed clean by the blood, if they haven't confessed their sin and recognized the knowledge that they are a sinner separated from God because of sin, wait a minute, Richie, I'm a good person, somebody might say sitting here today. Well, Jesus said there's none that are good, so take that up with him. He said that all are sinners and come short of the glory of God. And so, you know, there's, there's the bottom line. But we need, we need to proclaim the, the message of the, of the gospel of peace, no matter how offensive it is, offensive it is to the human heart, the natural heart. The Bible tells me that the human heart and the natural heart is desperately wicked, deceitful, who can know it? And there is no peace until repentance, turning from sin, turning to God, has taken place. And then that peace begins within, and then that moves out too. But a person is not going to know the peace of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding, until they have experienced peace with God. And that only comes through bowing down before the cross, before Jesus Christ, and being washed clean in His blood, and coming into a right relationship with God on His terms. The peacemaker that Jesus is talking about then are those who spread the good news of the gospel that they themselves have received through grace, through faith. Quoting again from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. You know, for a child of God, this is not an option for us, but it's a privilege. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It's not an option, it's a privilege. You know, when, when the most dynamic thing has taken place in your life, that of becoming born again, Why should it be any want to go to others when we've read a good book, seen a good movie, heard a good song, met a new friend that we just really think is the most special person in the world and we want to introduce them to it? What is the difference? Well, there's a big difference because our God, I mean, can't even be compared on these things, but boy, we, we just take these things, these little, small, trivial, trite things, uh, like they're the most important thing in the world, and yet... Blessed are the peacemakers, those who will share the God of peace and the gospel of peace, because they shall be called the sons of God. We should have so much more desire, so much more motivation, so much more joy in sharing the gospel of peace. It, they, yes, there will be confrontation, but we should have joy in knowing as we have shared the message in love to the lost and dying loved ones, in our families who live next door that we work with, should have so much more joy in that than sharing any other thing that we have to share in this life. What a privilege it is. The idea behind what Jesus is saying here is that of actively bringing good into people's lives. Bringing the message of the gospel of peace to them. You know, it's unfortunate, but there are many Christians today that simply just don't want to fight. They just don't want to get involved in this fight. Well, I've done it once, I've done it twice, I've done it three times, and I've done it enough. I'll just sit back and say, give peace a chance. And we need to be embracing. We need to be praying for those doors to continually be open because I want to tell you here today that I believe, maybe it's my own personal belief, but I believe that the time is very short that we have here upon this earth. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon, very soon. I believe His return is imminent. It could be at any moment. It could be while we are here this morning and we wouldn't have another chance. 
I can't tell you how many people have come to me, though, when they've lost a loved one, when a loved one has died. Oh, I wish I'd shared the gospel with them. Now's the time. Now's the hour. Now's the day. Don't let that moment go by that you lose a loved one, that you have not shared the gospel of peace and the God of peace with. Don't let that day go by. Well, Richie, I don't know what to say. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for you. Share your life. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It's about the new life that you and I have in Jesus Christ. The new life that He has given us, having, having set us free. Does that mean I do it once and twice and say, Whoosh, that's it, thanks, I've told them, now they're on their own, you know. I hope somebody else comes along and tells them, I'm not going to get involved, I'm not going to fight, I'm not going to confront them anymore. Well, it's actively bringing good into people's lives. The word shalom, which was the Hebrew greeting, is actually the word for peace, and it describes God's highest and best for you. When the Jew would say shalom, it means I desire and I want God's highest and His best for you. One commentator said that this is really the creative, aggressive force for goodness in a person's life that will result in peace, in inner peace. The world and the nations of the world today are without peace if they're without Jesus Christ. Neighborhoods that we live in, homes are without peace as long as the Prince of Peace is not reigning and the God of Peace is rejected. Men, women, mediators, counselors can pursue peace all they want. But until there is a willing yieldness to the terms that God has set forth for peace, the terms that He has ordained, then there will be no peace and it will be futile. Sinful man cannot create peace either within or among themselves apart from receiving the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This rung on the ladder resulted from the last rung of a purity of heart that we spoke about last week. Being cleansed from all unrighteousness through faith in Christ who is our peace. And then because of that, because of having received the grace of God as the enemy of peace, the enemy of the cross. But it took that that real peace could be established. Jesus says today, peace I give unto you. Not the peace that the world gives, but my peace. Judges 6.24, we read that God is the source of peace. He is the Lord of peace, Jehovah Shalom. And this is the message of the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. The proclamation of the God of peace and the gospel of peace. Because we have made peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We can know the peace of God that passeth all understanding and all the little ripples of life that come our way. And we can share it with others and we can show them that God, the peace can be made with Him also. And that they too may be called the sons of God. Isn't that cool? If you believe in Jesus Christ today, you are called one of the sons of God, adopted into his family. You have an inheritance in heaven. How cool. And you've been given the privilege and the opportunity now of sharing the peace of God with a lost and dying world. Are you confident of that? 
today that you are one of the sons of God. On what basis? Because only the person who has made peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ can have that confidence. Acknowledging that you are a sinner. Separated from God. It's not playing games with Him anymore. It's not coming to church. It's not, you know, going through church rituals. But it's really coming to terms. The natural man doesn't want to hear this. Because the natural man thinks that he is a good person. But again, the Bible says that there's none good, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, which is separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through faith in His Son. God offers that peace today. He comes offering real peace to all who receive Him today, but it's an act of faith. It's up to you. If you're going to San Francisco... You might wear some flowers in your hair. If you're going to heaven, you want to be wearing the crown of life that God offers through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Have you received Him as your Lord and Savior today? Do you know Him? Have you made peace with Him? through faith in His Son. As we prepare our hearts to receive the communion elements today, this is the question that each one of us must have settled in our own hearts and lives. So let's just go before the Lord and let's just uh, let Him minister to us here for a minute or two. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to establish peace. Because you see, peace, Lord, that we're talking about here is not all of this stuff that's going on around the world, all of the wars and the fightings and, the, and all of that, Lord, but it's peace with you. It's peace with you, God. And Lord, as men... Women, apart from you, we are separated from you because of our sin. Lord God, I thank you that you, Jesus, were willing to come, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. Father, I pray today that if there are any here that have never come to terms with you on those terms... Receiving Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of sin because they have acknowledged, Lord, in their heart, in their lives that they are desperately lost and they are helpless and hopeless apart from you. That their sin will separate them from, all, for, from you for all eternity if something isn't done about that. Thank you, Jesus, that something has been done about that. But now, now, Lord, the ball is in man's court to receive and to believe the forgiveness for their sin through faith in you, Jesus Christ. But Lord, there must be a confession of faith and a confession of sin. So Father, today as we prepare our hearts, as the gospel of peace is offered today to all who will receive, Lord, we ask, is there any here today, any here today, who have never made peace with God through bowing before the, the throne of God, humbling themselves before the cross of Christ to receive His free gift to you today. If you want to receive the forgiveness of your sin, it is an act of faith. And I would ask today that if there are any, any here today who have never come into a personal and living relationship with God through faith in Christ, that today would be the day that you would not leave here today, that you would not leave this gymnasium that we pray as a sanctuary under the living God every time we meet here. That you would not leave here today without knowing Him, without knowing Christ and what He did for you. 
but that you would receive him as your personal Lord and Savior even this morning. Don't let another day go by. Will you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior today? If so, I would ask that you would stand right now that I might pray for you. Is there anyone here at all today that would say, Yes, I need you, Lord. I need you to be the Lord of my life. I need a Savior. And I know, Jesus, that you are the Savior of the world. The Lamb of God who come to take away the sin of the world and my sin personally. Is there anyone at all, anyone at all that has gathered with us this morning who would receive Christ in the forgiveness of sin? Will you please stand that I might pray for you today? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Well, Father, as believers, as we gather now, as we prepare our hearts, Lord, we know that Though we have been forgiven of our sin, Lord, we still sin. We still fall short of the glory of God. Father, we know that if we say we have no sin, then we lie and we do not the truth. So, Lord, today, I pray, Father, that we, if we've been harboring anything in our own lives, in our own hearts, if we've been trying to make excuses, Lord, in our own hearts, in our own lives, That, Lord, we quit making the excuses even this morning. Because I know if we've been making excuses, the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Though peace with you has been made, Lord, there's still an unsettledness in our hearts. And so, Lord, if there's that unsettledness in our hearts, if there are things, Lord, that we need to confess and to bring before you even today, before we partake of the communion elements today, Lord, I pray that we would just get with you. Get with you and take care of any unfinished business or anything, Lord, that's come up. Maybe something, Lord, that, that, that we thought was, was done and taken care of, but yet, Lord, it's still something that's just, it just keeps coming up, a habit that just seems to be uh, still, um, st- still, still there. Lord, we want you to take it away. We want the victory, Lord. Maybe it's our thought life, Lord. Father, whatever, I just pray that you meet us here right now as we prepare our hearts to partake of the memorial, God, that you have left for us to remember your death until you come. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Oh, Lord, may this be the proclamation of our life and the message of our heart. Father, may there be restoration in our homes and in our lives. May there be healing, God, as we just come before you even right now to receive from you the grace of your touch and your hand. Meet us here, Lord, even now. Meet us here, Lord, right now, ministering to our very need. As we come to you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, encourage us, build us up, strengthen us, Lord. If we've been defeated, been discouraged, been overwhelmed, been over, just overwhelmed, Lord, just set us free even today, Lord. Work, God, as we draw near to you now, preparing our hearts. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
joy, joy give I to joy give I to joy give I to joy give I not as the world gives give I to thee joy Show me how you put 
are so ashamed to love me. With the heavens passed away, all your scars will still remain, and forever they will say just how much you love me. So I want to say. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been made near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is, the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Lord, we thank that you are our peace. You have established, Lord, peace with God through your sacrifice of Calvary's cross. And Lord, as we gather today to remember, Lord, why you came to this earth to take away the sin of the world, to be the Savior. Oh, Lord, we rejoice in you. And we humble ourselves before you today, Lord, for the salvation that you have brought. And that, Lord, believers have received and is offered to all who will come in faith. And so once again, before we partake, if there's any here today who have never received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, what we're about to do is the highest act and highest expression of worship that we can offer unto our God, the God of our salvation who went to Calvary's cross, who laid his life down and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sin, for in it is the new covenant and new life. If you have never received and opened your heart to receive the forgiveness of sin, if you've never confessed your sin, now is the time. Because this is for believers. Believers. 
what we are about to do. It is for those who believe and who trust and who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. Otherwise, as the Bible says, you, you drink and eat condemnation to yourself because...